Our speaker today is Fritz Panakuk, and he's speaking on Wacky Alberta History. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Well, the wacky part comes in the middle, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, about uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, I keep forgetting how old I am, uh, I was offered the job of Director of Historic Sites of Alberta. And I was living at that time in Ottawa, dare we say that word. And I was, my, my friends immediately said, uh, well, you got an easy job, it's e instant retirement, because Alberta has no history. So gee, that's pretty easy. Uh, well, I thought about that, and I, being an old Albertan and having grown up here for most of my you know, young years, I thought this is nonsense. And I had a, a good relationship with the then Premier of, uh, of, of Alberta. Uh, and he said, well, what uh, has happened to Alberta? Alberta has become the last stop on the Toronto subway. And that's got to stop. People who come to Alberta have got to start to appreciate Alberta and its history. And he was very, very supportive of historic sites and uh, creating an understanding of the province. Well, so um, all the, the Easterners who came to Alberta, and I would say that that starts in 1890, but it's these people, the Easterners who came to Alberta, who actually started the, uh, the, the, the first sense of history. Well, what comes to mind when any of us think about Alberta's history? Well, we think about Indigenous people. We think about the fur trade, the Métis, we think about missionaries. Obviously in this part of the, uh, 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 southern Alberta we also think about you know, ranchers and the railways. Agriculture is key. And so we, we think about these, uh, these really uh, you know, key, key issues. What, what comes to uh, mind though is often not right. I've got to get my two computers to work together, but anyway. Uh, first of all, when you think about the fur trade, most of us think about adventure of some kind or other. Well, it isn't much of an adventure because the Hudson's Bay Company, the Northwest Company, they were critical corporate entities and their principal job, particularly the Hudson's Bay Company, was making sure the orphans and widows in London got their yearly <laughs> dividends. That's what matters. So the company was often accused of being sleeping by the frozen sea. And so they was just ignored. Well, so some people who think it's one side, uh, you know, the voyageur and all that exciting stuff, but really it was a very boring, corporate entity, and you have to study several hundred years of the company to get any fun out of it. That's true, <laughs> at least I, at least what I found, I spent many, many decades searching their archives. Well, then it's also about, you know, the pioneer existence. This is one of my favorite slides, and the woman on the right, on that side, uh, just so you know, I have done a painting of her as well, and then using that as an image, it's on auction right now for the Crozness Pass Historical Society for their great event. So if you actually wanted to own her, uh, you could buy her. Uh, but the, the point is, was, crafting and candle making and you know killing bears and all that was that the essence of most people's experience or was it the shopping frontier if you check most small communities in the first decade let's of their existence there were stores there and when you start looking about how much money it took to start a homestead, most of that money was spent whether it's in the catalogs or at the at the, the stores. Doesn't mean the other didn't exist. It just means in most cases we are a shopping frontier. Now the moment you think, oh well, I'll think about that. 
Maybe West Edmonton Mall wasn't an accident. Maybe it's part of our historic DNA. Well, <laughs> that's also the other images we have of the frontier, which often comes from across the border. It's things were pretty, pretty wild and you had to struggle against the environment. Well, that also in Western Canada is not as true as you might think it is. And you know, there's also, I, I spent some time in Montana with the Montana State Historical Society and they started thinking, what's the difference between Canada and the U.S.? I said, well, you think we're also a wild west like you were. Well, actually, we were quite boring, quite tame, and most people struggled like the Dickens to make money is what they did. They weren't uh, really fighting maybe the CPR, things like that, but uh, not, not, not others. Well, and then we also have the myth of the police, which is perhaps the truest of the myths. Uh, now, what does not come to mind when you're thinking about Alberta's history? Well, did you know that Alberta's Indigenous people were the most activist in Canada? Did you know that they're the ones that got the Native people of Canada the vote? It comes from Alberta. Education, did you know that the creation of the University of Alberta was probably the boldest thing that ever happened in this province? Most people forget that it was an early act of the first legislature. And that university retained a brilliant president who set Canada on a direction, not only Alberta. Alberta was the first province to have a uh, research council. The president of the U of A then goes off nationally and creates a national research council. So where does the impetus for research come from? It comes from Alberta. Same with healthcare. How many people here know that insulin, for example, there were two of the co-founders were also from the young University of Alberta. Most people don't know that. Or some of the early heart activities, uh, you know, work was also in Alberta in the early teens, coronary work. And that set a pattern that stayed for about 20, 30 years. Same with child welfare. It's one of my favorite. The, the, the Ottawa has occasionally odd mayors. Some people may say Charlotte Witten was odd or she wasn't odd. But nevertheless, she's the one that when she was in Alberta, she introduced amongst the first social welfare legislation for children. Again, that came out of Alberta. So we often underestimate parts of our heritage simply because we're not used to talking about them. Well, I like this cartoon. I, I, I look through newspapers for cartoons. This is a Kainai News cartoon, 1978. Now, this is the Alberta Heritage Fund was being created. Most people don't know. That caused a lot of discussion amongst Indigenous people. And as uh, this is one of the famous cartoonist uh, soup, and actually a, a soup had an exhibit at the museum here. And he's, he had a wicked, wicked sense of humor. But anyway, you can see what he thinks of the Alberta Heritage Fund and how it's going to benefit uh, the Indigenous people of the province. The other uh, item I had on that previous list was radio. Now, Alberta had its first radio station, I think it's 201922. But what's important is how that radio impacted people. It's sort of like today, you might see a cartoon where you've got a kid in front of you know, the, uh, the smartphone or something, and you're saying, eat your supper. Well, in those days, it was a wife telling the husband, get off the radio, stop listening, come and eat your supper. It was the same thing. Most of us don't know how important the radio was where there was so much isolation in the province. It was absolutely critical. And uh, do you know who I think followed William Aberhart on the radio because William Aberhart had so many followers? Jack Benny followed William Aberhart. So th those sorts of things, looking at the radio programs, can tell you a lot about how our, our, uh, a society is put together. 
What also doesn't come to mind is things like religion or the arts or wintering or innovation when you're talking about the history of Alberta. Most people say, well, the, they, when they do history, they do it by premiers. Like you got premier one, then you go you know, all the way to the present, and then and you think they define us. Well, they don't define us. What's really interesting is some of the issues that uh, are with us today were with us in 1905 when we were created. And this is a cartoon in the Edmonton, I think, Bulletin probably, uh, in 1905. So the guy sitting at the table is Sir Wilfrid Laurier, the Prime Minister. And you've got uh, uh, the uh, Oliver, who the MP from Edmonton, sitting there. And what does he say? You know, they're singing the ever, you know, the, the, the anthem, you know, Albertans shall never, never, never be slaves. Well, what he's singing is Albertans shall ever, ever, ever be, <laughs> be slaves. And if you look at what he's carving up on the table, uh, let's say natural resources belong to the feds, education, they're still influencing it, uh, you know, taxation got everything and poor Alberta is tied to the chair. So if we think that maybe our anti-Ottawa feelings started with, you know, the Lahey Trudeau stuff, no, it started back in 1905, ever it was so. And uh, it, it's interesting that Albertans perceived that that was what was going on. Uh, they're also in this early period, and I threw this one in, this cartoon, because this is Lethbridge. <laughs> in 1912, Lethbridge had the largest dry land convention that was ever held in North America. 5,000 delegates in a community that was barely that size itself. In fact, it wasn't. So it was an incredible seeking of solutions and seeking of uh, innovate, uh, solutions that led to further innovation. And this is really important. When people think about you know, farmers not being innovative, they're very innovative. Or Albertans not thinking about how to change what, what they're dealing with, actually Albertans are amongst, and this is part of the argument I have, the most innovative people in Canada. So then the question is, you, so you've got you know, the poli usual politicians, you've got all sorts of people involved in uh, historical writing. Uh, some of you may have heard of these people, and these are the people that have uh, made our minds, uh, created our historical minds. Uh, you may not know it, but they have. So you've got John Blue, for example. That's the very first book ever written on the history of Alberta, and it basically says the pioneers are wonderful. They struggled. Oh, they were just so great because you know struggle was so incredible. So it's a history of progress. Grant McEwen also focuses on pioneers. He's written more books on Alberta than anyone else, but he also believed in struggle against land, uh, you know, hard work will always yield its rewards, which we all believe. So he's had an incredible influence. Most recently, I suspect most of you have on your bookshelves somewhere Aretha's book, Mavericks, uh, and if not, uh, you, you should get it. It's a good and funny read. Well, she looked at Albert and said, we're all mavericks. In other words, I can't find anything that pulls us together, so we're all individuals and we're all going in all directions and that's just the way we are. Well, that's a, a way to look at the history. But I've spent most of my life reading Alberta history and local histories and histories of corporations. And what you find is that Alberta has a different history if you start looking at it. It's what I call a history of innovation and innovators. And that's what defines Albertans and sends them apart from, from others. Now, uh, you've got to see where I am in this. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, building of Al Alberta in, uh, it's around 1912, somewhere around there. It's okay, thank you. It's uh, the, uh, 
this is the ledge building. And what one minister once said to me, imagine a population of about 100, 300,000, let's say 300,000, envisaged a building like that. Uh, that took a dream and an imagination and a conviction that something big was going to happen. And he, the minister, then said to me, do you think Alberta ever had a vision again that was as great as this? Well, I leave that question with you because I think, yeah, it, it has had uh, additional visions. So uh, what themes can we pull out? Well, what, what do historians who are paid to do nothing but think about history? Well, generally we talk about Alberta, the Ontario province because all of our early immigrants were Ontarians, the form of the legislature was Ontario, the dominant forces, whether they're Ottawa or whatever, they were Ontario, and first, a lot of our first legis as laters came from one county in Ontario, actually Bruce. So you got to think, okay, well, maybe we are shaped by Ontario. Well, then you can also say, okay, what else can we do? Uh, do the, uh, the Aretha thing and say, well, we're the last frontier, because Alberta was. 1896, the last free land ended in the US, uh, and then they moved to Alberta, because that's where the next bit of free land was left on this continent. So maybe we're the last frontier, and that's what made us behave in a rather odd way, because if you failed in Alberta, where were you going to go after that? No other free land, unless you want to go to the Northwest Territories and freeze to death. Uh, or you can also go, a theory is that Alberta was the last but failed frontier. If you look at coroner's records, judicial records, and wills, and all that stuff, and newspapers, there, there was a lot of failure. There was a lot of early suicides in Alberta. It's something we don't talk about. But maybe we were the failed frontier. Well, I don't buy that. So you can do anything you want and make Alberta, let's say, the wacky history, because how do you pull it all together? If you have any chances, but I got, I'm going to run out of time shortly, is this is an early mural of done of Alberta done, the, I think in the late 50s, early 60s. It shows you what people then thought about the province. Missionaries <laughs> uh, taking over with fur traders, taking over and land speculators, and indigenous people uh, losing out. I mean, this is what that that's tells you. Well. It, I was responsible for the museums in Alberta for about you know, 10, 15, 20 years, somewhere around there. We did a lot of research. For example, the Reynolds Alberta Museum. You start looking at it carefully, what do you find? You find that Albertans solved problems through innovation. You look at the changes to machinery. You look at the changes in practice on haying. Some of it is unique to Alberta, and Albertans solved the problems they saw. So I tend to like that as an approach. Now, this guy in the center with the mustache uh, in the center of the page is, uh, is Henry Marshall Torrey. He was the first president of the University of Alberta. 1910, by 1910, he's graduating the first class of surveyors. And those surveyors, you know, all surveyors do is survey land, but they didn't. They also forced things like how irrigation and who owns water. They were involved in a lot of those debates. Some of those solutions were, and it's more complicated to let on, but they are Alberta uh, uh, solutions. So when, you, when the First World War comes along, what happens to the, the university? Well, good old Henry Marshall Torrey says, well, I'm in England now, I've got to support the war effort, we'll create the Cocky University. So all Albertans who went overseas and others could join the Cocky University, come back when they came back, they actually got uh, credentials. So he believed in research and learning and research and learning. Now the other thing I've done is I spent time investigating the history of various industrial um, places in Alberta. For example, the Turner Valley gas plant. If you look at the gas plant, you can say, well, yeah, some engineer in New York sent down some plans, you built it, and that was that. Not if you start looking carefully. What you find out is that the Albertans who worked at that plant adjusted things and innovated all the time to make that plant function. 
And that's something that in writing history people often forget, is ask the people who were working on, uh, on the site. Uh, and the, uh, one of the best stories, I think, is so. The federal government kept the oil sands lands when uh, they first gave natural resources to uh, the province. Most people don't know that they kept some of that oil sand. And the reason they kept the oil sands for a while is because they didn't believe that Albertans were innovative or clever enough to actually figure out how to extract the oil. So uh, the federal government did support some investigations there uh, in a plant. It failed. Uh, and the person who succeeded in the hot water extraction method was Carl Clark, who was at the University of Alberta, who was supported by the early version of the Alberta Research Council. So Albertans innovated their own solutions. Now that sounds like a bit um, much, but it isn't. It's true, I think. So uh, what is Alberta a history of? Is it a history of the wacky? Is it a history of mavericks? Is it a history of continuous progress to some future? Or is it a history of continuous innovation? Well, I'm, gonna, I, I'm arguing right now it's a history of innovation. I'm writing a, a course on the history of Alberta, which for the Athabasca University nearly finished, and that's going to be its focus. So we were the first province to have a research council. The Alberta Research Council was the parent of the National Research Council, if you think of it all, oh, Henry Marshall Torrey. We also were uh, very innovative in cultural activities, because initially I thought, well, maybe culture doesn't fit. It does. And what's interesting is that our innovation in culture, which could be uh, you know, the uh, public radio like CKUA in his early versions, which was Department of Extension U of A. The Department of Extension U of A, the Banff School, some of the very first artists in this province were very iconoclastic and had their view of what is important about this province. So yeah, in culture. And of course, in agriculture, that is where innovation is out of every individual farmer's poor. If you look at, for example, the uh, inductees into the Alberta Order of Excellence, the majority of them are innovators, and the majority of them actually have a hand in agriculture in one way or another. So it's not accidental. Uh, I also, my, one, my favorite innovation, and it is an Alberta innovation, is the fitted bed sheet. Uh, and, okay, and the fitted bed sheet is a really good story because it was invented in Edmonton by a woman who was obviously tired of <laughs> making beds all the time and hospital corners and what. But you couldn't find capital, and that's often what happened in Alberta, is the failure to find the capital to move innovation forward. So she sold the patent to uh, the big American bedsheet company who's made a lot of money out of it. But it's, that's one of the biggest problems in Alberta is the capitalization of innovation. And the other thing is that people will say, well, you know, Innovation in politics, innovation in finance, did that happen? Well, yes, it did. Is if you start saying, Alberta, one party state, well, maybe it was and maybe it wasn't. Maybe you should start looking at how the various people have adapted politics and innovated in politics within the confines of the Canadian Constitution, because we've got certain boundaries. But again, it was very innovative. Uh, there was a lot of, let's say, and I'll conclude with this, riots in Canada in the Depression. There was the Aunt Ottawa Trek, there were all these issues. Well, how did Albertan municipalities deal with that? I always bring up the one, the Crowsness Pass, where, <laughs> which I call home. What did they do? They voted in, despite what anyone said, they voted in a communist government, thank you very much, and there were some radical changes in relationships there and how land was used. Was it the end of the world? No. But, but did people solve a problem that they had? 
Yes. So anyway, I leave this to you as just a food for thought in uh, 30 minutes. I've got a course that takes half a year that will go through this in some detail. Uh, so uh, anyway, it's been a pleasure talking to you and being able to share some ideas. <laughs> We like to thank the LSCO who provide this room free of charge and thank you for patronizing their lunch counter. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. Thanks to Shaw TV and Bridge City TV for recording our sessions. You can watch SACPAW on Shaw Spotlight TV or SACPAW.ca on archives or on YouTube. Thanks to the Lethbridge Herald for their coverage and support. Next week, the speaker is Mike Judd speaking about should bison be restored to the Eastern Slope public wildlands. Now, we ask those who are waiting to ask questions to please line up along this wall. Please state your name and your question briefly. No long preludes or stories, please. We expect respectful and polite discourse. And if you prefer to write your question out, only those legibly written and signed will be asked by me. So, so um, I think we can start with the, if anybody has questions. Are there any questions? Okay. And uh, I've been asked by Shaw here to stay back a little bit from the microphone. Don't get too close. It's very sensitive. Thank you. I feel like we've gone in the past with the phone. So Belinda Croson, um, one of the things, thank you very much for the presentation, it was awesome to listen to. But as you're talking about how we see history, I was wondering if a lot of how we see history is because people don't actually do history, they do memories and reminiscing. And when you look at Facebook pages, it's memories in Lethbridge, it's remember when. And since people can't tell the difference between their memories and their reminiscing, they think that's history, and which is why they don't have a true understanding of the, of the themes of Alberta history. Uh, that, that's interesting. Uh, the University of Lethbridge has a the University of Lethbridge has an outstanding oral history program. And it tells you that, in fact, oral memory matters a lot. But it's how you use it, how you analyze it, and how you think about it. It's everyone's memory is unique. It's just like uh, my wife always says to me when I'm looking at family histories, listening to children. She says, well, every child has a different parent. So every person will have a different history. So what historians do, like my, myself, is I try to assemble all of that information, just read and read and read and see if I can see patterns emerge. Because if there are no patterns that emerge in our past, then I guess we have to follow Aretha. We're all mavericks. But I do think there, I, I actually do see patterns. Um, and we touched on this briefly and we were chatting earlier, but uh, I came from Saskatchewan and um, we moved here six years ago. And I'm interested in knowing, Fritz, if you think there's a difference in uh, the culture between the provinces, between Saskatchewan and Alberta, and what do you think might be the reason for those differences? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, th then I'm going to uh, give the same answer I gave because I've got to be consistent. It's most historians of Western Can Canada or Western Western Canadian history will say that Saskatchewan was settled largely by people from British backgrounds or from the United Kingdom. They dominated the political discourse and the political process early on. In Alberta, the first migrants were generally, who dominated the political structure, were Ontarians. But the people who came in larger numbers, even certainly more than in Saskatchewan, were Americans. So in, in Alberta, you had 
an Ontarian dominated political structure because the Americans couldn't all vote initially. Then you had, and you had an American subculture, which is why you have someone like Henry Wise Wood in the Clare's home area who believed in a certain philosophy of politics that wasn't as strong in, uh, in Saskatchewan. So the differences are subtle, but most of the historians will say it's the difference between uh, the dominance of British, and some people say Fabian socialists, but I won't go there. And in Alberta, you have a different, a different cultural dominance. Now, it's very subtle. But nevertheless, that's what the answer is supposedly supposed to be. But then why are we more innovative in Saskatchewan as well? <laughs> Thanks very much, Fritz, for your presentation. Uh, some really interesting points made. Um, history is generally speaking uh, written by the winners of whatever, whatever you consider to be a winner. Uh, what about the indigenous perspective of Alberta history? Do you have any? Yes, any? I have some very strong thoughts on that <laughs> because I think uh, in 1857, which is not that long ago, all of Western Canada, and particularly the area we now know as Alberta, was dominated by the Métis people. If you look at the uh, people who were in charge of Fort Edmonton, for example, or in charge of the fur trade, they were all Métis people. Then if you start looking at the coming of the, you know, that's what we call them, the, the, you know, the, settlement, the settlers, what happened? Well, there's several things that happened. One, uh, indigenous people thought, we got we to gotta outfox these folks. They're dominant. But if you start looking at the political relations between indigenous people and, say, the farmers, and how that was managed, there is a really good study on the blood reserve which shows that many of the bloods were, knew exactly what was going on. They took a position of disadvantaged and attempted to move towards advantage. The other thing the indigenous people were really, really good at, they were, out, Alberta indigenous people in particular, were outstanding in politics and political maneuvering. And politics is something that is also an innovation. Who uh, fought the, uh, you know, the, the white paper, Craig Chan's white paper? Well, the, the, the counter argument came out of the Indian Association of Alberta, Harold Cardinal, and he produced the red paper. That led all of Canada in a certain direction. Who actually fought to get the indigenous people the vote? Well, as you know, before the indigenous people got the unfettered vote, the moment you voted, you were considered emancipated, you were removed from the reserve, you couldn't go back. And so it was really quite serious, and there was, there, it's very complex, but nevertheless, it, were, uh, it was Alberta indigenous people that fought and successfully fought to uh, secure the vote. So, and, and I can go on and on. So you have to be very careful. Where does innovation happen? How does innovation happen? Uh, and what exactly are the successes associated with innovation or changes? So yeah, indigenous people fit in, and they are, uh, there's some really good studies on innovation. The other uh, last point I'll make is, uh, Indigenous people, when they first started farming, and the very first farms were in Manitoba, uh, and what happened is they were so successful that some of the farmers around said, put an end to this. These people are getting support from the federal government and everywhere else. It's unfair, so shut them down. And that's actually very, very briefly the sort of things that happened. But th th they were hugely innovative as well. So they're part of the story and an important part of the story. Thank you very much. <coughs> A very interesting title to your talk. <laughs> I would agree on the wacky. My name's Bev from Latherstone. Back better? Okay. Um, 
I thought the various things that you talked about in terms of histories all have a place within the history of Alberta, and uh, your pattern of innovation sort of draws it all together from a particular perspective. Mm -hmm. But as the old adage goes, necessity is the mother of invention. So perhaps you're making uh, an argument that uh, in Alberta there's great necessity for innovation and invention. And I'm just wondering what could you put on your uh, future looking glasses at the moment and say now during this time of um, great political upheaval and um, uh, just looking at what's happening in our province, w what innovations would you expect to see in Alberta at this time? Okay, well, th uh, thank you for, for, for that question. Is there's an awful lot, some people will say that, you know, in the French, and the more it changes, the more it's the same. It's uh, the, wor the words that people are using for political upheaval today, uh, they were probably stronger uh, when social credit was elected, and people were equally upset about, <laughs> about that. But did it stop innovation? No. Uh, you have to start looking for it in Alberta because it's infinitely more complex with the new technologies. But for example, smart board uh, was invented in Alberta. Did you know that Java language uh, that changed the way computers uh, spoke that it was invented by a, uh, a student actually at the University of Calgary. Uh, when you look at Alberta Innovates, which is still motoring along underneath, you know, political turmoil up there, sort of like the duck, you know, like paddling away. <laughs> it's Alberta Innovates is doing some incredible work as well. So what you've got to do is, is figure out what are you going to look at? Are you going to look at social and technological dynamics or are you going to look at politics? Because we're all involved in politics, politics is easier. So I thought, no, I'm going to see what we can find if we start poking around the arts, poking around education, poking around what's going on in the farms or in, uh, in various uh, industrial areas. What is happening? Now, you may be right is that you know, Alberta just happens to be, as someone said, the last best West. If you don't make it here, if you don't innovate your way out of a problem, you're, it's, it's the end of the world for you because there's no future. There's no next West. Well, I've done a study of what happens to failed Albertans. Like, you go look in the 20s and 30s, uh, where did they end up? Because they didn't all kill themselves, you know, or they didn't all wallow in poverty either. They went to California. Now, and, that, and that is really interesting. Now, there are two jurisdictions in North America that are, uh, have probably the most complex religious environments. Alberta is one. We have more unique religious groups than any other jurisdiction in North America. So we're finding interesting things to deal with our situation. The next is California. Is there a link there? Don't know. But it's certainly interesting when you start poking around. I'm from California. Well, there you go. Maybe it's a reverse migration. <laughs> what happens to Californians when they can't make it there? They come to Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Trevor Page. I much appreciated your presentation. <laughs> Could you tell us when the Hutterites arrived in Alberta mm. and whether, in fact, they contributed uh, in terms of innovation to agriculture? Okay, I, I mean, I, I haven't done a detailed study, and when they came... 17? Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, the way I look at the Hutterites is they were involved in, this, this is off the top of my head, in land assembly disputes. They were involved in some of the arguments over uh, 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 corporate uh, you know, ownership of, of large tracts of land. To me, that did change, make things change, and maybe the change, upon further investigation, can be looked at as 
innovative. Uh, so I don't uh, have a ready answer because I haven't looked at it, but I do know in my head, I think, is that I cannot find a single group that in the end hasn't engaged in innovation that hasn't in some way been Canada first, or first in Canada. The idea of innovation first came to me when the, uh, the Governor General did a presentation to a number of us, and he'd had written a book about a decade ago, maybe, about innovation in Canada. And he listed all of the items that uh, you know, he thought were really key to Canada's innovative heritage. The one thing I looked at and I thought, gee, you're missing a lot of stuff in Alberta that I know about and I don't know a lot, so let's poke around. And then you find out, oh, yeah, the rest might be innovative, but we're more innovative. <laughs> now, is that true? Well, I suspect there's enough truth in it uh, that uh, it's worth poking around and to see exactly where this would lead us to. Uh, whether it's innovation in you know, child welfare and innovation in politics, innovation in painting and arts. There's some areas where I've had difficulty, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll work at it some more. <laughs> My name is Mark Edel. The Freedom Convoy, how do you think that'll play in the history of uh, Alberta? How will that be seen? Oh. Is that a huge innovation? Well, it, uh, it, actually, it's derived from American action, so no. But <laughs> uh, I, as a historian, I, I'm delighted to be able to not deal with the present. So I... <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I can reflect with, uh, usually it takes about 10 to 15 years for things to, uh, you can figure out, you know, where, where the consequences of actions lie, what their roots are. But uh, I have my own political views, but those are different from a historian's views. <laughs> Good question, though. <laughs> Uh, lots of fun, and thanks very much. My name's Ian Hurdle. In my family history, I have an uncle who is a graduate of University of Alberta in mm. electrical engineering. Um, somehow they gave him an OBE because he had uh, invented the third channel for tank communication for the Battle of Wartuna that mm. the Germans couldn't listen in on. Now, my orphan uh, grandfather was part of this migration that came out for grain harvest. And I keep thinking of the Newfies that come to the oil sands, and somehow he survived serving in two world wars <laughs> from Alberta. Yeah. But how is that people that trekked out here to harvest grain, how does that fit into our world? Well, I think they, they, they come because there's work. It's just like coal miners or any other workers. But what they do when they're there is what I'm interested in. Because it's like, who, who, do pe who were the people who came to, let's say, the Turner Valley oil plant uh, or gas plant? Well, they had jobs on site and they, for whatever reason, started to innovate. Now, you might argue, well, they were so far away from the controls headquarters in New York or wherever it was that they could innovate because communication was not rapid then. Also, it can be argued that people who came uh, on the harvest excursions were threw away the fetters of civilization that Ontario or whoever had put on them, so now they were free to innovate. I mean, you can argue that. I wouldn't do it, but uh, there, are, there are some who might. That, that is what some very early American historians would argue. In, uh, when you move west, why is the west different? The west is different because you could remove the shackles of civilization and, and do something that was really different and innovative. Okay, accept that, but then why did innovations happen in Alberta that didn't happen elsewhere? And I think part of it is leadership. And the person who is most ignored 
in the history of Alberta is Henry Marshall Tory. Without him, we wouldn't have a research council, a national research council. We wouldn't have had the insulin discoveries or the heart stuff. We wouldn't have had all the, uh, uh, the innovations in uh, the, the land surveyors either because it was his leadership, and he was extraordinarily dynamic at the right time. And he was an extraordinary person. He founded more universities than most of us ever attend. Like he founded, uh, you know, he was involved in McGill, he was at UBC, Saskatchewan, Alberta, you name it. <laughs> and he pushed there. And what he pushed was research, innovation, and excellence. They, a lot of the stuff that happened in Alberta, at the University of Alberta Research and in the cultural field was funded by the Carnegie Foundation during the Depression and the 20s. Most people don't know that. Well, why did Carnegie dump so much money in this remote part of the world, which was so isolated? It's because Henry Marshall Torrey and his successors had connections with them. And they could actually call them directly and they would actually see the need here. Most of the fact that uh, rural Alberta has a rich cultural life and heritage, a lot of the early activities were funded through the U of A through the, by the Carnegie Foundation. I mean, it really, it's really fascinating to see how all of this interconnects and why it happens. And if somebody said, what's the one factor that mattered the most? I would say, don't ignore leadership. And maybe we're looking in the wrong place for the kind of leadership that matters. Maybe the leadership of our universities and our research councils is what really matters when we're trying to build a community. That's what Alberta's history will likely show, and it will be unpopular because who's ever heard of a guy called Henry Marshall Torrey, unless you went to U of A and took an arts degree and went up in the Torrey building. But that's about it. <laughs> Thank you, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, my name's Patricia Boswell and... You have to back up. I gotta back up? Am I right there? Okay. Uh, I'm one of the immigrants who came over here. Still have some accent, I'm told, uh, I, but it was extremely strong when I came here. And I found, we, we spent the first six years in a small agricultural town very few Brits there, and I found that there was a perception that we were going to be arrogant, elitist, okay. and uh, yep. you know, found ourselves superior, so that took a lot of beating down. But, um, I, by the way, I'm a very proud Canadian now, so <laughs> let's get that straight. Um, have there been any interesting stories about racial mis- mistakes and, and problems that you can think of that, that have been, uh, for example, um, I, I met very few German people when I came out of here, but I was born into that war, so I didn't have a very high opinion at that time, and I had to grow up and learn about that too. Um, has there ever been hostility? I mean, we've got a lot of Dutch people here, a lot of... Very nice, so. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I know one very well. Uh, yeah. Um, Hungarian people, lots of mm -hmm. European backgrounds that wouldn't have been friendly. Did any of that carry on over yeah. here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh Alberta has not the most pleasant history of uh, uh, intercommunal communal relations. For example, we did have internment camps during the First and Second World War, and that's part of our history. If you want to look at a small community that had many, many different cultures, uh, go to the Crowsness Pass. Uh, and in some cases, you one town wouldn't go and visit another town. Young lady once said to me, we wouldn't go to the dances in Coleman for anything, because being from the, the snotty folks, mostly Ontarians, from Blairmore, we'd get beaten up. So we, we wouldn't go there. 
there. So were there animosities? Oh yes. And there's also other facts that are interesting, at least from a scholarly perspective. For example, it's somebody has done a master's thesis on uh, those people who were confined uh, due to mental illness in Pinocchio in the early years. Now that's really interesting. Now what do you think is the demographic profile of people who ended up there for that in you know, those early decades? It was, no offense intended, it was largely women from isolated farmsteads and mostly were British or English, UK. It's simply because living in those isolated communities, and you've got to remember, before the car, particularly before the electric starter in the car, you know, you, the husband went to town, you were left alone, and it was pretty awful. Uh, and some of the early, you know, like Alberta's interesting is because the impact of the electric starter on women's involvement in politics is profound, but most people don't take that as a, as a connection. But it did matter because you could break an arm cranking a, a car, but once the electric starter started, that, that was okay. That's, that's, uh, that was, uh, the start of some of the real political changes in this, in this province. It's also, if you look at interesting things like steam cars. Steam cars are more efficient than motor cars. The reason they never took off is because you almost had to know what you were doing in order to start one. And some of the original inventors of the steam car, uh, they did not like women, did not believe women should drive. So all of the valves were under the front seat, a lot of them. And the reason, they, they, they wouldn't change those and they wouldn't change the mechanism because women shouldn't drive. And if, you know, pulling up those long skirts to go and try to fiddle those valves. No. Nope. So it, there's lots of uh, intersections of technology and culture that need to be examined. And I think we're too, we, we focus too readily on politics, which I can understand because that affects all of us. But innovation impacts all of us and leaders and leadership in the province impacts all of us. So I think we have to start taking leadership more seriously uh, than we might have in the past. Uh, and particularly leadership at the great institutions, which we often ignore for, you know, <laughs> until we, until they cause us trouble. <laughs> Thanks very much for your presentation. Can you comment on the, um, uh, oh, Lori, sorry, Lori Schultz, my name. Um, can you comment on uh, the innovations or make any commentary around the women's right to vote in 1916 in Alberta? Mm. Um, any, you know, what was, uh, how did that all come about? What could you share with us from your perspective? Well, that was what I would call uh, the whole uh, women's suffrage movement in Canada had its rights uh, or had its foundation in Alberta. The business about women uh, being persons, for example, that fight originated in Alberta. So none of the events of women's suffrage were unusual. What you start taking that as a, as a baseline, then you say, Okay, who was involved in getting the indigenous people of Alberta the vote? Same kind of fight. Well, it was people like Ruth Gorman. Ruth Gorman was about, I think, the third female lawyer in the province. She fought toilets for women in the city of Calgary and won because toilets were not considered essential during even market day. She also had uh, the dower rights movement. It's also part of the whole women's movements in the province. So if you start looking at dower rights and you start looking at, it sounds elemental, but washrooms, uh, you look at other things like uh, uh, disadvantaged groups and their inclusion, you can track the origin of a lot of those fights to the women's movement in the province. And again, that's something, and, and women were hugely innovative. Now, was everything uh, lovely and great? No, because some of the 
uh, the women who fought for uh, being declared persons, one of them may have been in the legal system, may have actually occasionally sentenced young ladies to work in her house when they were not appropriately behaving. So, you know, was everything on top? You know, the things went on. <laughs> Will that be one of your chapters in your kind of <laughs> On my course, I, I, you know, I only have six months. And, and 35 lecture hours equivalent, so that's not a lot of time. Because one of the things that I think is really important in the study of Alberta as well is our innovation in finance and debt. Now people say, oh God, this is boring. Well, there's some really interesting articles in the Alberta Law Review on how the province has structured its debt, and that happens very early on. So there's innovation in finance, and I don't mean that in a negative way. So we've got to start looking at all aspects of our past and then seeing how it comes together. But I just think that the study of debt and accounting is really absolutely fascinating, probably because I know nothing about it, but <laughs> uh, you should read some of that stuff too. <laughs> okay, one last question. So, uh, my name is Knut Peterson, by the way. Uh, right now in Alberta, we have a significant movement by a group called Take Back Alberta, who, among other things, uh, think that it's women should go back to being pregnant and, <laughs> and barefoot. Good point. <laughs> Could you comment on that, please? Uh, I know it's not history, but it will be. Oh, well, there have been lots of um, movements in Alberta over the, the decades. Some of them are more uh, eccentric than others, and they're part of oh, I failed innovation. <laughs> and so I, I just look at it and say, you know, if my observations of the patterns are correct, that there are many streams in history, and so some of them are streams that won't go very far. Uh, that doesn't mean that people don't have their right to speak their minds, uh, but it's, uh, you, you've got to look at where the major flows are. The danger in history is often is what they call upstreaming, which is what most people do is you, you go upstream, like where did we come from? Then you went to the next one, you go to the next one. You never go up the little rivulets that never went anywhere. And those are the ones that are the most interesting. So do I think uh, we have those kind of reactions? Yeah, we'll have that. When social credit first allowed women to become more involved, there was strong opposition. Uh, you know, when, when uh, women were allowed into law school, there was strong opposition. Uh, but, you know, these things, when you have a strong spirit of innovation, rather than moving backwards, the innovation tends to win out. And when the, if people say, take back Alberta, saying, you assume we ever had it? Look at that cartoon from 1905. In 1905, we knew we didn't have it. It's we were a creation of a federal entity and we've been fighting ever since. This is why debt and finance are so interesting is because those are, in essence, controlled under the Constitution by the federal government and by you know, professional associations. But nevertheless, there is room for innovation. So I don't worry about stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Do you have any take-home message for us before we <laughs> close, or have you covered everything? Well, Thank you. my take-home message is always keep an open mind and when you look at the past don't look at the usual things look at different things look at why do you think something is the way it is and then i really hope that people start also to reflect on the nature of leadership in a highly technical society and look at our universities, our innovation uh, institutes, who's leading them and where are they heading? Uh, do we agree? 
But right now, none of us have any input into any of what I call the intellectual, social, uh, and economic leadership in this province. We, we only have input into political leadership. So I think be concerned when you have a new president of Leth the University of Lethbridge or University of Alberta or wherever, because they're the ones that are can ultimately make a difference. Tory made a difference for over 100 years. Not every university president will. But uh, so it, to me, it's really important to be involved, be conscious you know, in, in, in leadership and in your institutions. That's my last word. Thank you. <laughs>